Raina Campbell, your chief dream driver, and welcome to the No Parking Podcast, where through conversations and discussions with creators like yourself, we'll find interesting approaches to help you take your dreams out of park, put them in drive, and ride towards success. Hey, Dream Drivers, welcome to episode 140 of the Dreams and Drive podcast. And today we're going to be talking about how to find a gap in the current market and build something that stands out and fits a unique need for your customers. We're going to be chatting with Tracy Busher, who's the founder and president of New You Clothing Line, a company she launched in 2015 after finding that most collegiate affinity wear items were designed with men in mind. She's a fashion industry veteran and has worked at top brands, including Jockety, Calvin Klein, and Tahari. And she launched New You because she wanted to create clothes clothes designed specifically for the fun and fashionable woman. Over the past two years, the New You clothing line has grown to include more than 35 items featuring the logos of more than 30 different colleges nationwide. And I thought that was interesting because a lot of times we don't necessarily think about licensing as a business model, but Tracy in this episode is going to explain how she's able to leverage other brands in order to build her business. And you'll hear all about that directly from her. She talks about how to identify a gap in the market and create a must-have product for your audience. Some of the things that we also talk about in the episode include how she got her start in fashion, the collegiate wear apparel business, learning licensing, creating a niche your customers don't even know they need, getting funding, and how she leveraged her family for that, three tips for successfully launching your own clothing line, and how to figure out your customer profile and more. So this episode is going to be very logistical, but also very fun. And I think it's important for us to open up our minds and really start thinking about unique industries with in bigger industry. So we all know fashion, right? We all know fashion design, but have you ever thought about licensing as a business model? And get this, our giveaway of the week is so bomb. We are giving away a $100 gift card to the online new use store so you guys can go and shop and, and get some really cool collegiate apparel or you can get new you branded things as well. And if you go on my personal Instagram and you scroll down a few You might see a Princeton outfit that I'm rocking at the gym. It's all new you. It's so cute. Her stuff is very, very well made and it's super stylish and cute. So that's what I love about it. So make sure you go to dreamsanddrive.com slash win to enter that. That's a $100 gift card dreamsanddrive.com slash win. And if you listen to this episode and really enjoy what you hear, please share it. I am so thankful to you guys each week when you're reposting on Instagram stories, Twitter, Facebook. That's how the community grows each and every week. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And please continue to do it. And if you're not following us on social, make sure you are. We are Dreams and Drive across the board on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And one thing, the sound in this interview is a little bit funky at parts just because I had to do this interview via phone because of timing. So please, please forgive me about that. Other than that, hope you guys enjoy. Can't wait to hear what you think. Hi, Tracy. Welcome to this episode of Dreams and Drive. I'm so excited to chat with you today. Oh, thank you so much. So am I. Uh, as you know, I love to start interviews going back in time. I, I always think it's so interesting to think about who we were as children. So if I had to say, you know, what was inspiring you, what was the young Tracy like as a nine-year-old, how would you answer that? What would I say I was like? Um, you know what? I was very athletic and um, very creative. I would say I got a lot of my creativity from my grandfather, who was a political cartoonist for her okay. syndicate. Oh, wow. Um, Today, his cartoons reside in the Presidential Museum in Texas. So out of my my parents have five children, and I would say out of the five of them, I'm probably the most creative, and I probably attribute some of that talent to him. That's amazing. So did you have a dream as a young Tracy? What was it? You know what? I always wanted to be in fashion in some capacity. I didn't know how I'd get there, but it was definitely something I had always hoped for. And you were in Ohio, so that definitely wasn't the fashion capital of the United States, right? No, but um, my mother worked in retail when she graduated college. She lived in New York City, 
and was a buyer for Macy's, always has had a great eye for clothes and fashion, and started going to Milan twice a year to shop for the latest fashions, and I would oftentimes accompany her, and the two of us are very similar in our tastes, and I'd say we have a real connection there. We both <laughs> love clothes, accessories, shoes, you name it. So how do you um, think that love for fashion uh, translated as you grew into a young adult? I think I always had a natural sense of style. I mean, even when I was in high school, I was always sort of trending, I think. I mean, back then it was Argyle sweaters and L.L. Bean boots to, you know, what I like today. It's still on trend with what's happening in today's fashion. So you moved to New York City when you, after graduating from the University of Michigan, why did you decide to then go back to school to Parsons? Well, I had actually... uh, and applying to business school because my father is a firm believer in higher education. That was really not what I wanted to do, but I was doing it because I knew I didn't want to be a doctor or a lawyer. And <laughs> All our parents want us to be that, right? <laughs> exactly. And so I sort of had this come to Jesus moment um, and called my father and said, I really want to speak to you. You know, if I go to business school, it's really not what I want to do. I've always wanted to study fashion. Is there any chance you would allow me to go to fashion school? And um, it was actually his father that was the cartoonist, and I, I firmly believe my father felt that uh, some of my skills came from him, So, or from his father, I mean, and and he actually supported me and said, if you know, if you can put a portfolio together and get into Parsons, which is where I applied, that he would pay for it. So that's what I did. I went to Parsons for fashion design and initially was doing children's clothes when I came out of school and went to work for a company called Jacquerie in Paris designing clothes, and then came back and started my own company, a children's work company at the time. No, we're kind of like thinking into the future, but did you ever think that you would be an entrepreneur and have your own company during the beginning days of being in fashion? Was that the goal? I grew up with a father who was an entrepreneur that started his own company, and so it definitely was in my blood, and I think it was also something else that I had hoped to achieve. I don't know that I thought I would do it as soon as I did, but I definitely like to create things and sell things and sort of do things my way. So, yeah, I mean, it was always a hope and dream that I would have my own company for sure, and I think it seemed like the normal thing to do because that's all I knew. We lived and breathed it. I mean, you know, we would work in his company uh, for a few weeks every year, to know what it was like and uh, to, I mean, he would have us work in the factory, quite frankly. What kind of company? The laws were not as strict as they are today. (laughs) What kind of company did he have? Uh, He has a manufacturing company. He manufactures diesel fuel injectors. Oh, wow. You were working in Really sexy. (laughs) You were working in a diesel fuel injector company? Factory? Well, when I was little, packaging parts, yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You probably couldn't get away with that now. Uh, no, could not. <laughs> when was the shift to then saying, hey, I'm in the fashion industry. I could kind of do my own thing. When I was in Paris, you know, I was designing and Jacquerie was using all my designs and I thought, this is crazy. I should be doing this for myself. So I came back to New York and proposed the idea to my parents, and um, they supported the idea, and I was set up as a subsidiary to one of my family's companies. So you had that. I noticed the theme that you mentioned with your parents. Um, were you very close with your family growing up, and did you feel like, you know, every move, well, not every move, but you wanted to make them proud for the decisions that you were making about, especially your career journey? I guess if I were to really think about it, you're probably right. <laughs> Yes, no, they I were very of, influential yeah, and had, definitely had a big it. impact on what I did. I felt I was very fortunate with what they'd given me, and they'd given me a great education, and I definitely wanted to make them proud 
for sure, I think. You know, I'd seen that both my parents had worked hard and had a good work ethic. And even though I was very, very fortunate, I've always been driven. And they instilled that, I would say, in all five of their children. That's, I think that's important because I know like for a lot of people who have come on the show, and even people who are listening in, we don't often realize just how much our parents have played a role in our lives. Like the other day, and I'll tell you this, Tracy, so I came home, like my parents, I grew up in a Caribbean household. My parents were Jamaican. And so they weren't very big on like outwardly saying, I'm proud of you to, you know, their kids, right? It was one of those things where like, you should know I'm proud of you. And the other day, the other day I came home and I saw my dad, he was in the basement listening to a podcast episode on the computer. And it was just one of those moments for me where I had never heard him say, like, I'm a fan of your show or I listen to your episodes. And just seeing him kind of like doing it in secret was this moment where, like, I didn't realize how much like my dad's own hustle and philosophy had rubbed up off on me because one of the biggest things my dad always told me when I was younger, he hated when my sister and I would use the word bored. He said, you can never never be bored if you have a mind. Just hearing you talk about your own family and how, you know, growing up in the, uh, working in the factory and just seeing your dad be a, you know, a businessman really influenced you and just getting their support. It's just something we don't often connect the dots to until later, you know? You're right about that. So with with your children's wear company, what were some of the challenges that you faced with getting that off the ground? You know, it was totally different then because you didn't have the Internet. And mm-hmm. uh, What year was this? Just so we can get oh, it like that. So I'm just, trying to think. Um, I don't know, what, 2006? You know, you didn't have really any high-end children's wear manufacturers in the States. And so I would say I was one of the first, like you had Viva La Fet, um, some of these that were out of El Salvador, and you had several out of Paris and Italy, but there was really nothing coming out of the U.S. that was very high end. So I felt there was an opportunity there for me. Um, and mm-hmm. seeing how well Jacquerie did, and they had stores throughout the city here in New York, I felt, wow. You know, I'm going to take advantage of what I learned in Paris and apply mm-hmm. it to doing something on my own. And back then, you know, there wasn't um, J. Crew Kids or any of this. And then things began to get much more casual because I was doing, you know, pants, mock dresses, boys, short alls with knee socks. So it was very traditional clothing. And mm-hmm. today, you know, lifestyles have changed. People have become much more casual and you really don't see kids dressing like that anymore. How long did Tracy Busher collection, oh. how long did that last? The Children's Wear Company? Yeah. Uh, four and a half years. And then my husband had gotten a job overseas in London. So I went over there and brought it to a close. I don't, I didn't sell it because it would have required selling my name. And I thought if I came back to the States and I wanted to go back into business again, I didn't, I still wanted to own my name because it was called Tracy Busher Children's Wear. Well, then I moved to London and I had two children over there. (laughs) (laughs) And you were just kind of, you were just took a break from business and uh, to be a a mother, or were you also still working in the fashion industry? I was doing some freelance here and there. So let's fast forward to the brand that I really want to talk to you about now is New You. What was the impetus and what was the inspiration for starting this brand? I attended the University of Michigan. When I was in school, every time I would go to the bookstore, it was still very geared towards men or guys, and I felt there wasn't much choice for women. And... Uh, a couple of years ago, I realized it was still the same on many of these college campuses. The assortment and choices for women was very limited and thought, wow, there's a really big white space there for collegiate women. And I really should take advantage of that and do some elevated collegiate wear and uh, see how it's received. And so really it began initially with, I don't know what, we, we call it a new kini. It can be a, a bathing suit or a bra that actually has a dog tag that sits like a piece of jewelry on your chest. It started with that, and I have that patented, and we also have one with a interchangeable magnet that you can change what's 
there. And from there, uh, I grew a collection around that and did a beta test at the University of Michigan at a opening game day. The Emden, which is a big store on campus, the owner, Scott Hurth, was kind enough to support this, and it was a big hit. And then I realized, wow, I think I'm onto something. Fast forward, I started acquiring more licenses for various schools, and from there, built out the business. So let's talk about that, because I um, I know I recently just trademarked uh, Dreams and Drives, so I definitely know that it is, uh, you can't just use, you know, uh, another person's name. Like, what was the whole process for getting licenses and really becoming like, um, I don't want to say a licensed product business, but like how did you really figure out the niche and how to work with different universities and get and acquire those licenses? You know, it was trial by error. Initially, I would contact the licensing directors um, directly and Mm -hmm. offer to come and meet them. And I would bring some of my Michigan swag with me and show them and see if this would be something they would be open to. If it was received well, I would apply for the license. And there are different companies that you apply through, like IMG is one of them, Fairmont is another. There's different ones for different schools. You don't have to meet with the licensing directors, but I felt in starting out it was very important. I was new, and I really wasn't, calling myself active wear because I was not, you know, I wasn't there to compete with Nike or Adidas or Under Armour that sponsored many of these schools. I was really a lifestyle brand. So it was really a new category for them that was developed. That's interesting because you would think, I know like when I went, to, I went to Princeton and so you go to the university store, you have like your normal type of university wear and, you know, just seeing the type of things that you were designing, you made university wear or, you know, clothing look chic, you know? And that was definitely something that you didn't get in the campus store. So do you think that was a sell to them, although they weren't directly, like, are they directly selling new you in their own stores or was it more just, like, they're not selling it directly in their stores, right? You know, we're very selective with where we place it um, because we want to make sure it's sitting next to something that, is not going to sort of disparage the brand. You know, it, it's, if our brand is sitting next to a $7.99 T-shirt, you know, that's really not elevating the brand. And it sort of loses its panache or it being cool. Because we think it's sort of a cool, like you said, fashionable, elevated collection. Like you could wear this our sweatpants, you know, with a pair of golden goose tennis shoes and a silk shirt. Mm-hmm. Um, Blouse. I mean, we, we show this stuff more in all different ways, you know, and we, we feel it can really go from day to night. We really don't tell our customer how to wear it. We let them decide, you know, whereas most brands sort of tell you how it should be worn. Was there a specific cost that um, you had to put out in order to acquire the licenses? Like, is it something that's affordable or is it definitely an investment? Oh, it's an investment. Because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. I just think it's so interesting, right? So this is a really good business model, but just from, like, the back-end logistics part of it, it, it is a hefty investment. It is. And it, I'd say one of the most challenging things about business um, with these licenses in the schools is each of them are almost their own business, and they have their own nuances. You have to be sensitive to all of that with each individual school. Can you give an example? Like you don't have to name a school, but maybe just talk about the types of nuances that exist. Certain schools uh, are very strict in terms of which bodies they will approve. They may not want something like a bathing suit being sold, you know, a licensed bathing suit for various reasons. There's a lot of stuff that goes on college campuses today that, You know, you really have to take into consideration when designing this stuff, which we do. Colors, certain schools are really, really strict that, you know, the Pantone color is exact and it's very hard to get there. And others, you know, you can be slightly off and are a little more lenient. It really, it really varies. 
How did you go about choosing the schools that you wanted to work with? Well, initially, I wanted to choose big schools, schools uh, where sports and football were important, that were rah-rah schools, a big student body, because when you're producing things, you have certain minimums that you have to meet. And I knew with the larger schools, I'd have an easier time meeting those minimums. Being that we were elevated, we were a little more expensive than other lines. And so I was tactful in the locations that I initially chose and hoped that uh, the student body there could afford to put a little more towards uh, their college gear. How did you uh, get the funding to get the business up and running? Because I that starting an apparel company or any type of fashion industry, there's a lot of upfront costs that you have to put out, especially because you're not like private labeling the clothes, you're like designing them and all that stuff. So can you talk to us a little bit just about financing? Because I know there are some people who are listening in who want to start their own fashion companies, but costs can be prohibitive. No, it it most certainly can be. So I initially (laughs) um, went to my father with the bra idea, which we have since patented in numerous countries around the world. Um, and he wasn't, he didn't really get the whole concept, but he said, listen, I'll give you some seed money and mm-hmm. you can get started with that. So he gave me some seed money and from there I knew that it was going to take more than that. So I went around and I met with uh, some different people in the industry that had companies and um, uh, three different companies said, oh, they loved what I was doing and would I be interested in partnering up, some sort of partnership. And so I went back home where I grew up, which is Cleveland, and sat down with my father in hopes of getting some advising as to what I should do. And I think when he realized that, wow, if these other three companies, which are pretty big, think she has something here, maybe, maybe we should keep it in the family. <laughs> and I should um, set her up again as a subsidiary. So that's what we did. Oh, wow. So you kind of had to game your dad a little bit. Well, not game him, but <laughs> get him sold on the idea. And that's something that can be translated to any, any person like you're trying to get money from your, from your family or other people. You kind of have to uh, what's the word, create a demand or create a hype around it, especially when you're trying to get the investment money. Right, yes. And, and you know, once I got some big schools, um, we or I was able to get some financing as well from the banks because they felt more secure in lending. Also, if you're a women's own company, there's some advantages that you can take up take advantage of too. What kind of other resources would you say they can take advantage of? You know, the great thing about University of Michigan is it has amazing networking. Um, So I definitely took advantage of school after I graduated and what it could possibly offer me and people that I knew that had graduated. A very good friend of mine is CEO of Equinox. Um, Oh, wow. And, you know, I met with him. You know, we were great friends in college and still are, and he's here in New York. And, um, you know, he gave me guidance um, and some ideas in terms of technology because that was that's definitely challenging, um, being that I'm really not from that generation of social media. Equinox has done an amazing job with all of that and how they've built up that company. So I was able to tap into my friends and another very, one of my roommates from college, she had some great suggestions for me and said, you know, you really don't need to hire people full time and put them on the books today and give them health care. You can hire freelancers and it's a way of keeping your overhead down uh, while starting up. So, I, you know, I really looked to uh, my friends and actually my parents for a lot of this these answer these questions that needed answering. So you launched the company in 2015. What do you think has been your biggest growth struggle, and how is the brand working through that? I, I would say understanding technology and social media, okay. and in taking on you know each individual's job in order to have a better understanding to further our growth. 
you know, that has definitely been a big learning curve in terms of, you know, really scaling the business. I'd say my biggest challenge has been gaining brand awareness Mm -hmm. because there's so much out there today with the internet and social media. I think it makes it much more challenging, even though we know who our customer is and we know where she shops. She shops on her phone. I can imagine. I feel like that's something that we all kind of share, just even with me uh, growing the podcast, is technology because there's always something that you could be using to do something better, right? And just making yeah. sure that you're doing that and that you're ahead of the industry and you're ahead of the trends and all that stuff is so important. But, you know, not only – from not challenges aren't the only thing that you want to talk about. Um, just thinking back about over the last two years with the growth of the brand and what you have been able to accomplish, what do you think is your biggest success and, like, why are you so proud of that? We've definitely created a niche that um, was untapped. I still do believe this. I really don't think that there's much out there today. I think there's a, a lot more stuff for women in the collegiate space come out the last couple of years, but I still don't really feel there's anything really as elevated and as fashionable as ours. I mean, because we also sell boutiques. We don't just sell necessarily the college girl. Collegiate is trending. It's trending all over Europe. A lot of our pieces can be seen as, you know, a fashion statement as well. Yeah, and I think thinking beyond what you would think is your customer is, is so important because, like, when you said you sell to boutiques, you sell to women, like, I'm a huge Princeton, like, I love, you know, I'm a huge, I read Princeton all the time if I can, right? So it is nice to be able to have Princeton gear that isn't so, that doesn't make me look like I'm still in college, but I can still rep it in a way that's fashionable and suits my lifestyle now, Right. And that's one of the yeah. things that I really like about your brand. Um, and I know that you guys have different schools and that you do that with, even with your Essentials collection and your Wonder Woman collection. I think there's something there about taking a concept, collegiate wear, and putting your own spin on it. And that's something that a lot of us can do. Like we think we have this like simple idea that everyone has done before. But it's about how do you take that and put your own unique perspective and spin on it, right? Definitely. You went to design school, you launched your own company, you took a break, you came back. What was the thing that you really learned about yourself? That 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 thing that you're like, wow, I didn't know I had this in me. I, I absolutely love my kids. That is a job. But I do like getting up and going to work. I know that's not necessarily for everyone, but it's something that resonates with me and um, it just makes me feel much more fulfilled and the great Mm -hmm. thing about owning your own company is you have that autonomy so when I need to do something with my children I'm able to which I'm very fortunate to have that ability Um, but I do like getting up and uh, going to work and the challenges that come with it how big is your team? Like, do you have your own, like, uh, office space, factory, workers? Like, how, how do you structure um, your team now? Office space here in New York, where we work out of, as well as we have our own warehouse in Houston where we do our own fulfillment. You know, we uh, have factories in uh, China and Pakistan that do our production for us. Did you have to go through a learning curve of just learning the ins and outs of production and all that stuff, or was that something that you have learned in your uh, career in fashion? Um, I have mm-hmm. learned a lot about that when I had my children's work company, actually, because okay. I was manufacturing as well, and I shared in a factory in El Salvador, and I would go over there all the time and uh, work with the sewers, and it really gave me insight as to what, goes on in a factory. What are three tips you would have for someone who's listening in who is trying to or is interested in starting their own fashion line or currently launching their own fashion line? Like, what does it take to be successful? It takes perseverance, for sure, and ability to sell because you're going to have to sell that idea if you want financing and you got to really believe in it. You've got to be creative. What is something that you, like, what keeps you up at night when it comes to your business? What motivates you when you feel like giving up? Where am I going to go next with this? Um, mm-hmm. It's something that I'm always uh, thinking about. 
you know, how I can further my growth and develop the business. What's the broader vision for the brand? Like, where do you to see the company go in the next few years? Gaining global brand awareness. Um, and we currently have a custom patch program uh, that we are developing, which is very popular. You'll see with Gucci. And, and we know that our customer likes to personalize things. So we are capitalizing on what's trending right now. And we're going to have... Uh, our own patch program in which you can personalize uh, the essentials or the collegiate wear. You mentioned a lot, you know, before we close out, you mentioned a lot about just knowing your customer. How did you really get to figure out who your customer was and what her customer profile looked like? We knew we were going after the college girl. That's the primary one. And then I would say the alum, the alumni. I would say the mother of the daughter who just got into that school, who's proud of where their daughter just got in and wants to wear something, and the little sister. It's very targeted, which is great. So we know exactly who we're going after. So um, okay. now we're going to go into our lightning round, Tracy. So this part of the interview, I'm going to give you a prompt, and I want you to tell me the first word that comes to mind. And remember, we're sticking with our whole dreams and drive metaphor, okay? Okay. The first word is park. <laughs> Um, I, when I think of that, I think of coming up with a laid out plan. Reverse. Backing up and reevaluating things. Neutral. Uh, I can go either way. Then drive. Put it in gear and go for it. Mm. And if you want to be a dream driver, you have to have your key to success. So what do you think are three things every dream driver needs in their toolkit before they hit the road? Like I said before, I think perseverance is essential, Um, being creative-minded, and I would say, again, the ability to sell is is really important. Mm -hmm. Those are all great tips. Thank you so much, Casey. Can you tell our dream drivers, where we can find you online and learn more about me and you if they want to check out the site. Sure. Um, our website is wherenewyou.com, and it's spelled where, W-E-A-R, and new you, N as in Nancy, U as an umbrella, Y as in yellow, and U as umbrella again, dot com. And then okay. you can find us in college bookstores and various boutiques around the country. Thank you so much, Tracy. All right, so that's a wrap for episode 140 with Tracy Busher. I hope you enjoyed hearing her dream driving journey as well as her keys to success. And if you love that episode, the best thing you could do, the best thing you could do is share it with one person or many people. Repost it on Instagram stories, screenshot it, post it on Twitter, send it via text to someone, post it on Facebook. You guys, I really, really appreciate when you're out here sharing it and I'm going to always appreciate it. So please please continue to do it. And if you're not already following us on social media, make sure to go and follow Dreams and Drive on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I also want to remind you to subscribe to us wherever you're listening. If this is your first time, hit that subscribe button so that you get notifications every time we have a new episode. And don't forget... We have a really cool giveaway this week. New You has generously offered to give one of our dream drivers a $100 gift card to their online store for a shopping spree. You can get whatever you want with that. So please, please, please go to dreamsanddrive.com slash win. That's dreamsanddrive.com slash win if you want to enter that. I want to take some time out to read some reviews. Last week, I asked you guys to show up and you did. So I'm going to shout out Squeaky Moore. She was actually one of our past guests. She left a review that said, so conversational. When I listen to this podcast, I feel like I'm sitting on a sofa with my BFF, learning, laughing and getting inspired. Thank you so much. And this one is coming from Daniel from the Plot Twist podcast. And he says, got to keep it in drive. I love this podcast because not only is it a super raw and eye opening, but it's personable. Like you feel like you can relate to these people. Raina is really good at keeping in contact with us on social, which helps us be more engaged and ready to act on what we just heard. Thank you, Daniel. I really do appreciate that. And yeah, you know, hit me up on, on social media. Hit me up on Instagram, especially. I love hearing from you guys. I love 
love responding I know sometimes I may not be able to have like long deep conversations but I always try to respond to everyone who hits me up or responds to my Instagram story so please continue to do that so our call to action this week I have been asking you guys to join our Facebook group, which you guys have been doing. You can always join us by just searching Dream Driver Mastermind or going to dreamsanddrive.com slash Facebook. But this week, I have a specific ask of you guys. I want you to join our online newsletter. So if you want to get our weekly Dream Driver newsletter called The Keys, I've been trying to put it out at least once a week. Just go to dreamsanddrive.com slash join. That's dreamsanddrive.com slash join. And get this, guys. I don't know if you know, but I did launch a Dreams and Drive blog. Um, just go to dreamsanddrive.com and click on blog. My hope is to create more content there right now there's just an article up about podcasting so definitely check that out and I also want to let you know outside of being able to purchase dreams and drive merchandise at dreamsanddrive.com slash shop where you can get hoodies crew necks and t-shirts I'm also going to start offering digital products and right now we have email templates up for sale so if you are a podcaster and you need some help with guest outreach and pitching guests and doing that whole guest flow go check out the email templates that I have up for sale there they're what I use with my guests and they're super helpful and super useful and I know that my guests really enjoy the communication and prep that I give them for each episode so go get them if you are having trouble reaching out to guests or if you're having trouble just making sure your guests are prepped before interviews and all that good stuff so our next guest up on the roster is going to be Missy Pierre Val and I think you guys are going to love her story she's an ex-NFL cheerleader who get this sued the NFL and got money and she's also a nurse with her own community called scrub angels all right keep dreaming keep driving and we'll chat again in episode 141 bye guys